Danny, thank you so much for joining us. We know you've traveled a long way to be with us today, and we know that the circumstances that bring you here are really quite traumatic to talk about. Um, so first, I wanted to thank you very much for doing this on behalf of um, all of Australia to educate us, to better help us better understand all of the factors that led someone like yourself to profoundly disconnect and feel like suicide was the only option. So if, could we start from the very beginning, Danny? What were the reasons why you joined the Defence Force? So I was 15 when the recruiters first came to my school and the idea first came to me to join the army. Um, it was the job of medical technician that really sparked my interest and you, it was the job of being a medic in the army. Um, it was to be a nurse to help people. Um, but also the army had all the qualities of integrity and courage and bravery. All those sort of things really was instilled in me as something important. So the Defence Force presented itself to you as it always has to all of us who join the Defence Force as an entity that has strong values, strong moral values that really resonated with you. Is that right? Yeah, an opportunity to grow and develop. And do something for you and your country. Yeah. So tell us what happened when you joined the Defence Force. What was the, the tempo of training like? going to uh, war zone. I can tell the Australian public that Danny is a very remarkable person. She is a very driven, intelligent young lady, very compassionate, and she was the top of the game that led her to be chosen out of very many medics in the country to go to war, to go to Afghanistan, with a lot of experience under her belt already, to do something valuable for the NATO forces in Afghanistan, 3,500 in fact. Tell us, what was the tempo of training like that led to be arriving in Kabul? So before I went to Kabul, um, you, I'd been doing quite a lot of training with 7RAR. Um, they were the guys I was deploying with. I'd taught them all on their combat first aid course, so I knew them, all the CFAs. Um, I knew a lot of the guys that were deploying, um, had a good rapport with them. Um, I obviously had got my 9 mil qualification, my weapons training test all done, grenade, everything like that. Um, I was getting, I was remarkably fit at the time because I was training for the Special Forces entry test also. Um, so you were top of your game? I was top of my game. I'd been a medic for five years. I deployed, had two small deployments to Papua New Guinea and Indonesia previously. Um, and yeah, I was a top of my game medic. I was teaching up a junior medic. So I was a corporal. Um, so let's, let's start from when you arrived at Kabul. You arrived in Kabul around January. So painting a picture for those who haven't been to the Middle East in, in that time of year, it's really quite cold, isn't it? In fact, yeah. it's snowing. It's, it's snowing. I didn't expect it. Yeah. I got there and it was like snow and it was like like Christmas. I was like people making snowmen and snow dogs and snow kangaroos. And yeah, it wasn't all fun and games, was it? There no. was a very serious side being a 24-7 role that you were in. Absolutely. To prepare for the worst. Can you tell us what the worst um, looked like? Yeah, absolutely. We we're preparing constantly for mass cab situations. Um, and for by that you mean? Mass casualties. So if to say a, a bomb went off and we received three or four casualties at one time. Um, so the threat of bombs and rocket attacks was really quite real, was it? Could you, could you piece this to get to give us some better understanding of what um, that threat looked like and felt like? Um, it was just a constant worry in the back of your mind. Like if you went to the mess and you were with multiple people and you just constantly thought like something could happen and you know, over there and there's 10 people sitting so close together, that's 10 casualties. So you're just like constantly on watch and like you went somewhere and there was someone driving a car and there was a couple of people walking and you're just like that car could just hit those couple of people. That's a mass casualty situation. And so the mass casualties could also involve rocket attacks directed to the base as well as ground attacks. Can you talk, talk us through what a ground attack is? So a ground attack could be someone just pulls out their weapon and just starts firing. So it could be from a friendly who's just, um, who's just turned or it could be an um, a insurgent. 
So, so with a couple of thousand people on base, each carrying up to two live weapons, can you tell us what um, what that feels like as a potential, uh, as a medic with potential for mass casualties of an enormous nature with so many people carrying live weapons? What, what does that feel like? It's overwhelming because I, I was like carrying three tourniquets on me, but the three tourniquets would treat one person in a mass casualty situation realistically. So you're very, very like overwhelmed if something does happen. Can you tell us a little bit about the casualties that you saw? Yeah, so my worst casualty was one that had a RPG to the head. Can you tell us what that means? A ro rocket, uh, rocket, rocket propelled grenade to the head, um, and it partial head, partial of his head was um, missing. And so I hadn't been in the back of the ambulance with me for a little while, and like accidentally stuck my hand into his brain cavity. Um, obviously, when the ambulance was moving and everything, so that's. So you you me. were really quite traumatised from the moment you stepped foot into 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 the war zone, as as most medical professionals are. Is that right? I wasn't traumatised by that. Like I didn't get PTSD from that. Like that was part of my job. But in terms um, of you in heightened stress. Yeah, I was absolutely stressed. I was less the constant like the my stress levels were very high. I was doing com compensating measure measures by like running constantly during early hours of the morning and just things like that to try to stay sane really. Um, so would you say that you were at a heightened stress level um, for the whole duration 24-7 of your deployment? Yeah, absolutely. So on top of all of this stress that you have as a medic with a couple of thousand people in your dependency, with mo multiple threats of ground attacks, of rocket attacks, of, of friendly um, fire, of um, accidental discharge, of, of all the things that could possibly go going wrong that you're constantly surveying around you 24-7, tell me what were some of the other stresses from your, the people that you were deployed with. What was the, the dynamic like of the medical professionals with whom you were working? So right from the beginning, early on, um, about week one I went wrong, the, there was a, the sergeant and platoon commander charged one of the other officers for leaving his weapon in his room. Like very early on, so it turned sour. And then, um, then the relationships in the platoon started to turn even more sour early on. There was games being played. Um, so this was the, the platoon commander, can you tell me, he was a doctor, is that correct? Yeah, he was a doctor and his role was a medical role and the sergeant was meant to be there as a medic role as well but he said he was there as regimental. So can you he, tell me exactly what he said? He said when we first met him, I'm here as regimental, not medical. So somehow there was a confusion in their own mind as to what their roles were. They were deployed as medical personnel, but were acting in a very regimental capacity yeah. and tripping people up in their most stressed mode. Yes, he was acting like he was an RSM, when in reality he was a medic. Tell me what the platoon commander was doing. The platoon commander was playing a lot of mind games. He had a medic was doing weapons training tests and so his rounds were inside the um, the office in his hat and the um, doctor stole two of the rounds and so when the medic came back in to put the rounds into his magazine um, the doctor had the rounds and so when the medic went to leave the doctor was like didn't you count your rounds and he had stolen the rounds and so that medic could have left and had less rounds in his magazine. And the rounds are there for a reason. Yeah, absolutely, they're live ammunition for a war zone. And so that just caused a lot of distrust in the team. Um, there was a situation where the two doctors, they, they didn't really like each other very much, so the platoon commander, he actually changed the pin code on the other doctor's weapons trunk and to try to prove that he wasn't checking his weapons daily and then he laughed about it to us ORs, uh, other, the soldiers about it and said that and proved that he wasn't checking his weapons daily to get him in trouble. 
that's the little one. mind games. I'll just like it'll pick away at everyone's sanity. I think most people would agree that this is way outside the realm of what we would expect a doctor and a medic to be doing to their fellow medically deployed personnel in their most stressed moments yeah. of their entire possible career. Yeah, you go into that sort of environment expecting your team to support each other and give each other like help and like be there for each other, battle buddies, but this team was just toxic. So three weeks into your deployment, it was found necessary to um, report these, this behaviour to headquarters downtown Kabul, is that correct? Yes, we went up to and reported it to the equity officer. And what rank was the equity officer? A major. A major. And tell us what happened from there. So she brought up the, um, the sergeant and doctor and we all spoke about it. Um, they decided, yes, there was, they were being inappropriate, they shouldn't have done, they shouldn't have taken the rounds and things like that. Um, they apologised and they... And did that achieve unit cohesion from that point? No. It just caused more like distrust and like... When did you first notice things going wrong for you personally? Um, like... What well, was week two really for me? Like earlier on, I'd had little things, but the um, my roommate who was a dental assistant was always just like, "What's wrong with you and Sergeant?" Um, yes, he's constantly talking like he snaps at you all the time, and this and that, and I was just like, "Yeah, I don't know. Like he's just awful," but. Um, but things really went wrong when after um, when they called me in for a record of conversation well they didn't call me in first they called the um, my friend in who was the, the aviation doctor and they accused him of having an inappropriate relationship with me and in these records they were stating that they were just saying that our, the rank relationship was inappropriate, that a, um, a captain would, or no, a lieutenant would be around a corporal. But in the record of conversation they said, what would your wife think? So it wasn't a, a rank relationship, they were really going for the relationship. And then when I was caught, and then he, he sent me a message after he got caught and he's like, look, they just accused me of sleeping with you pretty much. And so I, was, I got that message and I was like, oh, wow. Like, this is pretty How's scary. How's that impact on you? Because can you tell me, how old were you at the time? I was 20, I just turned 23. 23? Yeah. And how old was he? He was, um, I don't even know, he was probably like 26. 26. And, and what, was the, um, what was the impact on, on him before we touch upon you? What, how did that impact on his? He sense? felt awful. Like, like, we were just good friends. We were both training for the Special Forces Entry Test. Like, we both had the same interests. We were both rock climbers. I wanted to do medicine, as you know, eventually. Um, he was a great teacher. I, like, we'd talk about his wife. I had a partner back at home as well at the time. Like, we were just purely platonic. So there was a three-year um, age discrepancy between you I and don't a very you. common interest yeah. in your in your professional career both going for special forces both very much interested in the same exercise endeavors um, you would you would say that in a war zone you were a supportive friendship of each other would that be correct yeah absolutely we were really good friends we just supported each other we um, like we'd check in on each other if you had a crap shift someone had passed away we'd like check in each other make sure we were going okay we'd go to the um, they did salsa at the Turkish to try to like keep the morale up. Like so, Danny. In the context of your deployment, in which you had multiple threats from all around you, ground attacks, rocket attacks, potential friendly fire, potential mis, mis accidental mis discharge of weapons, um, there was a constant threat of death for you and everybody around you, for whom you were responsible as a medic. You were constantly under threat from your own unit. People tripping you up, playing mind games, stealing weapons, stealing parts of um, essential ammunition, and amidst all of this, you formed a supportive friendship with someone that was then 
ripped apart and made out for you to feel like you were somehow having a sexual relationship with yeah. this person. And the, the platoon commander even had went around to the whole hospital and asked people if we had been sleeping together. So he'd also not only accused us, but he'd also spread the rumour, um, which was really embarrassing and I'd just got torn apart because my whole career I'd worked so hard to just be known as a good medic, as like top of my game and never to have like inappropriate relationships or anything like that and then to be suddenly accused of having an inappropriate relationship in a war zone, mm. I was just torn apart. It was, yeah. Danny, before we start talking about the next phase of your deployment, which is the most traumatic part of the deployment for you. I just want to paint a picture for the audience listening to us today, just how hard it is for you to tell this story. You have had, correct me if I'm wrong, 40 rounds of electroconvulsive therapy, multiple medications put into your body. You now have, as a consequence of that, word finding difficulties and, and memory issues that uh, may or may not be permanent, but at the moment, this is very hard for you to tell these stories just on a cognitive level, let alone a psychological traumatic level to tell this. Is that correct? Yeah, so I've had, it was roughly about 38 rounds of um, ultra brief ECT so that really affected my memory um, plus the post-traumatic stress you also don't have memory forming you lose your memory forming ability during the time so I've lost about two years of memory properly like my short-term memory um, I fumble with words I have word finding difficulty so often during conversation I'll just stop and not be able to remember what word I'm looking for. I can describe the word but I can't actually like bring up the word. So to reassure the audience, I know your story very well so yeah. that um, you're not um, in any way memory impaired or false memory no. implanted in, in I've got, your story. I've got everything written down from like I very much remember what happened in Afghanistan. I just have blurry patches. I've got everything written down from when I was over there. I was writing stuff down as it was happening. Um, when I first got back to Australia before the ECT, I wrote it down. I made statements. And in so, fact, you made a video that became internationally famous explaining the experience of suicide and some of the traumatic events immediately after that. Um, I think it's now time that I ask you, Danny, you were three months into your deployment when things got unbearable. Two weeks after, or days in fact, after that record of conversation that took place where you were ultimately accused of inappropriate sexual relations with an officer, um, your only real support network in that entire war zone, days after that, is that correct? things became untenable for you? Yeah, so I'd lost my main support, my best friend overseas, So, and I'd lost my reputation. They'd went through the whole hospital asking people if I'd been sleeping with him. So suddenly I was the hospital-like slut. I'd, I'd been shamed. Um, I was so embarrassed. Um, I, my whole career felt like it was over. Like Afghanistan felt like the pinnacle to go over there and deploy to look. Let me paint one more brushstroke on this picture, Danny. Your mother ended her own life when you were quite young, and your family network is really not as strong as other family networks, is that correct? Yeah, my family spread across Australia, so I um, didn't have a tight family when I deployed. So the army was my family, the army was my life. So this letdown was a major letdown for you? Yeah, I didn't have another life, out. I didn't have a life outside the army, the army was my life. Mm. It was everything to me. Tell me what happened, Danny. So, um, I'd been, I'd been accused of sleeping with the officer or having inappropriate relationship, but on the under the underside of that charge or potential charge was sleeping with him pretty much. And then I got called in again the next day, and I was having another record of conversation. This time for um, because I didn't wake up a member of my team who was on night shift um, so someone else could go play basketball so I was getting another record of conversation for that and then the next day I was on duty and by this time I decided I was going to kill myself because I felt my career was over 
and I felt like everything I'd worked for for the last five years was destroyed, that like my whole dream of being a special forces medic of like it was just ruined, that my reputation was in the dirt. And so I'd packed up my room, I'd written some notes, I'd written the big posts that I was going to put on Facebook and I'd sat there and contemplated how I was going to kill myself and I knew I couldn't shoot myself because of the casualty that I had with open head wound so I knew that I couldn't inflict that on anyone in my team to have to come and find me with an open head wound like that. And like I thought about shooting myself through the chest, but I knew that was too risky. Like it may not be, um, may not kill me. So then, so I went to work a little bit early. I looked through the drug cabinet and looked through the pharmacy list to find medications that were there. Um, and what they, if there was any medications that they didn't have the antidote for and I found digoxin and they didn't have the um, digibind so I knew they didn't have the antidote for that and whilst I was then I went on to duty um, and then I got called into the office again to sign my record of conversation from the day before and Sergeant S and Captain E were there and they expressed their concern for my welfare <laughs> And I'd already overdosed by that stage, so I was, I'd already taken 100 digoxin tablets by then and some anti-nausea medication so I wouldn't vomit. And I knew that like, it would take a few hours to get peak concentration in my blood, so I was, didn't say anything. So I just I laughed at them when they said that and I went back to work. And um, the nursing officer could tell I was upset, so she was sitting near me. And so I kept working for a couple of hours and then once I started to feel sick I asked another medic to take over from me um, and I hung out in the bathroom for a while and I was vomiting and then once I started getting an altered level of consciousness I posted the post on Facebook and then I was found. So Danny, your potential last memories were going to be your aggressors gloating over a potential charge for something you didn't do. You went and did your job right until the very end and you found a cover for yourself. You were diligent right to the very end. Yeah. Like, I know I shouldn't have been on duty when I'd taken the medication, but I knew that I knew there was another medic on duty with me and I found another medic to take over from me. So when you inevitably became unconscious, Tell me what happened when you when you woke up. So I became semi-unconscious in the bathroom and in, in which they took me to a resource bay and by this stage that some of them had seen my um, Facebook status that basically was a suicide note um, and they put me onto the resource bed and stripped me naked and this there was um, Everyone was surrounding me, so everyone I knew everyone in the team, and they were putting monitors onto me, and they were very panicked. Um, it was very chaotic. Um, and once they got the monitors onto me, they could see that my heart rate was very, very low, and that, and they didn't know what drugs I'd taken, and I wouldn't tell them what I'd taken and they started to panic and so they started to put nasogastric tubes into me. And tell, tell us what that feels like and the other tubes that were being put into you, tell us what that feels like. Um, it's awful, like you're laying there and you have no control, you feel sick, you're getting tubes just shoved into you, getting held down. Who was holding you down? Um, I had the platoon um, commander who'd been part of the bullying problem holding me down um, and then just other members of the resource team. And you're naked? I was naked, yeah, getting held down. I was struggling against them and then they went to put a catheter in and so and urinary, urinary catheter, catheter and I said no and started fighting against it and um, then the doctor in charge, so she was an American doctor, 
she um, then went and said, um, we won't put this urinary catheter in if you tell us what you took. So tell us, Danny, we know that when we take a urine sample in an emergency bay in a civilian hospital in Australia, that urine is very important for diagnostic purposes. Tell us the difference, though, in a war zone. Yeah, so there was no laboratory um, there to test the urine. There was pathology for blood, but very basic pathology for blood, but there was no pathology there for urine analysis. So let me get this straight. You were being revived from a suicide and their primary concern was to place a very invasive urinary catheter in you in a state of complete nakedness. That was their concern. Yeah. For no purpose whatsoever. Yeah, because they realised that I didn't want the catheter and they could use it as blackmail to make me say what I'd taken because she was, she was saying to me, if you tell me what you've taken, we won't put this catheter in. And I was begging them to stop. I was fighting against them. They were holding me down, pulling my legs open. Um, all sorts of stuff and after a while I was begging and crying and after a while I just told them I'd taken digoxin. Danny, you found your way back to Australia and in that very traumatised state, including the suicide attempt in Kabul, am I right that you've had seven suicide attempts all up? Yeah, I've tried to take my life seven times. So two were quite major, and, and five not so major, but definitely attempts at self-harm and suicide. Yeah, the two really major and five more. Before that last suicide attempt, quite a major attempt, we won't talk about that just yet, tell me about the mental health care system in Australia, in defence and outside defence, and what your experience was up until that last moment. So the mental health system I found in defence, they just put you into um, private clinics. Um, they just wanted to forget about you um, very much and basically you just put into a private clinic. Um, the psychiatrist just looked after you. Um, there was pretty poor care. Um, no, not trauma related, not post-traumatic stress related. It was, it was basically a hotel for um, middle-aged people. Um, that's what I found. There was no... And you weren't treatment. going to be forgotten about, were you? I mean, you had a, a lot of injustice built up at this stage and a story to tell. And yeah. the only way that you felt potentially you could tell that story, am I right, is by making a cry for help. Yeah, I was angry at the time. I was... Um, I was wanting to be heard, like, I felt like I'd just been, like, bullied and harassed and raped and, and they just put me in a corner and just locked me in a ward and said they were going to do ECT, so. Did you know what was going to happen with the ECT? Did you have any understanding of what that entailed? You would have known it was serious. Electroconvulsive therapy is a frightening term as it is. But what, tell us what that means. What Tell us what is electroconvulsive therapy. So it's when they take you into a room and they put you under general anaesthetic and they um, make you have a convulsion. Um, basically simulates your brain and it's basically it's supposed to improve depression. Um, I found it helped in the short term, but in the long term had a lot more effect, side effects than what was. Tell benefit. me about the side effects. So I now have permanent, like what well, seems like permanent, um, word finding difficulties, um, and my memory from the time is very um, bad. And medication-wise. Tell us about the medications. Was that a trial and error approach or was it a definitive, this is the drug you're going to be on forever? Tell us about the medication approaches. Very much a trial and error. They've put me on everything and anything. I've been on so many medications. Um, they put me on something and they take me off it, put me on something else, increase the dose. I've been on everything. Did anyone ever give you a DNA test to check your SIP 450 liver enzymes to work out which medication was specifically useful for you personally? No. They just hit you with a 1970s style trial and error over a long period of time? Yeah. Um, Danny, tell us about the doctors treating you and the nurses treating you. What was the level of compassion given as a whole? 
I had a really good private psychiatrist who I saw privately, but whenever I went into like a public system, like for like an emergency, um, it was awful. Um, I had doctors basically just judge me, tell me I was too chronic, they couldn't help me, turn me away. Um, they said you were too chronic to be yeah, treated. I had a doctor, I was asking for an admission saying I needed help um, and he said that I was too chronic, um, I couldn't be helped. And so I, let and me get I, this straight, yeah. a doctor said to you that you were too chronic to be helped with suicidal ideation yeah. after su massive suicide attempts. You were too chronic to be treated. You were too hard to be treated. Yeah, after only two years of experience in this, after sustaining a major trauma in Afghanistan, when previous to that I'd been perfectly healthy. And this was in an emergency department. In emergency department. And what was his duty of care to you? Did he up? Did he pass you on to a higher level of care? He discharged me when I was acutely still suicidal. I've been I've been discharged from multiple. Um, emergency departments while still suicidal. I was literally on the edge of a um, on a car park and they were offering me a taxi cab voucher home. They were telling the ambulance they could leave because they had, and the police that they could leave because they had private security there. And the nurse was saying, the head nurse was saying that I can have a cab voucher home. Danny, you found yourself being negligently handled by the public healthcare system and by the sounds of it, the veteran healthcare system as well around the time. To the extent where you had accumulated at this time six suicide attempts, you were being told by emergency department doctors and nurses that you were too chronic to be treated. In fact, you were handed a cab voucher to go home instead of being treated. Can you tell us how it made you feel being a veteran of war? who was raped in your workplace in a war zone at the height of your stress. You're abandoned by your country and now you're being abandoned by your very profession, the healthcare system, in the moment that you needed them the most. Can you tell us how that made you feel? It just felt after, utterly betrayed. I, I was just going there and I was desperate and I was just asking for help and I was just like, just please help me. And they were just, just say no, we can't help you. And I was reaching out, I was begging, like, just please help me. Um, I was willing to accept help at that stage from anyone. And the Jamie Larkin Centre, which is the Veterans Hospital, had completely excluded me, would not take my referrals, nothing. So they were. They were saying I was too sick to be in hospital, but they would let me go home. So there was, I'd just present to an ED with a suicide attempt. They would correct the suicide attempt, give me a reversal drugs. I'd be in the ED for a day or two, and then they'd send me home the next, the next morning. So, Danny, tell me what happened when you found yourself standing on a car park which was 10 metres above hard concrete ground. How did you end up there and what were the circumstances that made you jump? So I'd been in the, I'd presented to the ED um, on the Friday night when I'd overdosed, I'd taken 60 paracetamol and I'd gone treated for that and I'd stay in the hospital until the Monday when I was being seen by the psychiatrist and this particular psychiatrist I'd seen before and knew that she was quite awful but I was getting seen by her and I was begging her like this was like one of the last times I was really desperate I was uh, saying like, I really need an admission I just got in my gold card and I was saying I've got a gold card like can I get an admission interstate or something um, because the Jamie Larkin Centre won't take me I just need to go in the hospital because I can't keep doing this um, and Basically, she left the room and she came back in and said, I'm discharging you. And, I'm, and I said, I'm like acutely suicidal. I cannot go. Like, I really need help. And she said, too bad, you're leaving. And at that stage, 
Um, I actually ran up the stairs and I was still under a involuntary treatment order and the guards followed me and then she followed me and told me I was just acting, I was having bad behaviour and um, I didn't have post-traumatic stress, it was all just a um, personality disorder and the quicker I realise it, the quicker I'll get better. Um, and, and then I was just like, I'm going to kill myself. And she's just like, come downstairs. And so I just followed her downstairs back to the room. And, um, and then she just was there and the guards were there. And then she's like, I'm discharging you. And so I just was like, okay. And so I just well, was in socks and I walked out of the hospital lost in socks and the guards went to stop me and then she said no she's not on the treatment order anymore um, and I left all my possessions in the room and I left the hospital in tears in socks and um, leggings and a t-shirt with no phone or wallet or anything and walked out of the hospital no one stopped me in absolute tears I walked across the road across to the um super, the shopping center next door onto the double story car park and then I sat on the um the car park 10 meters high and sat there for a minute or so and then someone came up to me and was trying to talk to me and all I would say was can you please make sure they give all my money to my sister and then um, another person came up and was just like asked me if I was okay and I just was repeated just make sure they give all my money to my sister and then I just leaned, leaned backwards and well, by that time an ambulance had arrived because I was right next to the hospital and they were like you don't want to do this and so I just leaned backwards and fell um, 10 meters and then I woke up in the back of an ambulance Danny, this is one of the most heartbreaking stories that I've, I've ever heard in my entire career. You don't have a mum. You, you don't have. You didn't have someone to come pick you up from the ho the, ho the hospital from being discharged. You had nobody. You had absolutely no one to advocate for you on your behalf at this moment. You relied on a psychiatrist, a doctor whose job it is to look after your mind. And she was gloating at you, tempting you yeah. to kill yourself. She was. She was, she knew, she knew I didn't have a personality disorder. I knew that I didn't like when um, she accused me of having one. And so she really played on that. And she um, really just pushed all my buttons. And, I was, and she knew which buttons to push. She did, and and I said I was going to kill myself, and she just discharged me, and so, so I just walked across and went and tried to kill myself, and I honestly don't know how I survived. And you had a gold card. This was not a, ma a matter of the public hospital trying to save money. The no. money was coming from the Department of Veterans Affairs. No. I told them I had a gold card, I wanted a private admission and I, I was I'm going to state if need be. I was begging them for an admission because I was really unwell. Danny, tell me about the injuries that you sustained from that jump because we know that a fall from even two metres when it comes to a traumatic brain injury can be catastrophic and fatal. A Ten metres is very high. Can you tell me about the injuries you sustained? Yeah, so I had a laceration to my head. Um, I had three broken ribs and a pneumothorax. I had um, three compression fractures of my thoracic spine, um, two pelvic fractures, and a fractured sacrum. You would have been in incredible agony. Yeah, I was for a little while. It was awful. How long were you in hospital recovering from this? I was in hospital for a month. A month. Danny, around this time, a lot of us were, were in absolute agony for you and not knowing what to do. And I think that was the um, how most people who, who loved you dearly 
had absolutely no idea what to do because we trusted the hospital system to look after you and we realized very quickly that the hospital system across the whole of the country is failing veterans 100 percent it's almost as though they're set up to harm us but somehow out of all of this adversity you found yourself snapping out of it haven't you yeah um it was sort of like a wake-up call almost like i somehow survived and i survived for a reason and just my mentality changed overnight almost. Can you tell us what, what the, some of the things, if you're reaching out to other veterans who are wanting to kill themselves and potentially have to harm themselves already, what can you tell them was that experience in that moment that made you realize life was important and it was it, that death was not your destiny? What were the things that went through your mind? What can you tell veterans right now that saved your life? and it resulted in you being sitting here right here today? Um, I don't know if it was like, I sort of woke up and it was just like, there's a purpose, there's, I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna make a change. So you just gotta find your purpose. You gotta find your little piece of your world that you gotta make your little, your change in. You gotta find your little, your destiny. Dan, you're one of the most remarkable people I've ever met in my entire life, in my entire career as a doctor or as someone who has a little sister and an older sister. You exemplify courage, you exemplify bravery, you exemplify integrity and honor. All of the values for which you joined the Defense Force in the first place. You've overcome enormous adversity in the face of other people's dishonor and cowardice and failure to treat you. It's an absolute honor for me to sit here next to you today. You are a hero to me, you are a hero to a lot of veterans, and you are going to save a lot of lives by your story. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Harris.